flat earthers. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on social media. And let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. And okay, I'm kidding. Here's the real video. On August oh, and by the way, this was sponsored by NordVPN. I just wanted to put that joke in first. Okay, here we go. On August 15th, 1977, a US radio telescope picked up a strange and rather strong signal coming from deep space. The signal lasted for 72 seconds, but afterwards we were never able to detect it again, and to this day we aren't exactly sure what it was. When one researcher saw the sequence of numbers that indicated the signal, he wrote the word WOW on the original printout, giving it the name, the WOW signal. So no, the signal didn't say WOW, which would have been pretty cool. Doesn't sound like any radio signal I've heard. Anyway, the WOW signal had no encoded information and it was unmodulated. Sound signals in our hearing range lie between 20 and 20,000 hertz, but we don't just send those wirelessly. We first move the signal so it's centered around a much higher frequency, like let's say 96.5 million hertz, otherwise known as 96.5 FM when dealing with radio. This right here is modulation. That is then sent over the airways, and then a receiver moves the frequencies back down so we can hear the sound. That's kind of the basics of how radio works. The WOW signal, on the other hand, didn't use any of this modulation. However, almost two decades before the signal was ever discovered, two physicists predicted that if intelligent alien life tried to communicate with us through radio emissions, they might do so using a frequency of 1,420 megahertz. And that's because that would match the electromagnetic radiation naturally given off by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. This would be like a mutually understood value between advanced civilizations, and the WOW signal was picked up at almost that exact frequency. In fact, we think it's so likely that alien life would use this frequency that it's illegal for anyone in the world to use it for broadcasting. Now, of course, this signal could have come from a variety of sources. A few years back, one researcher said that a comet, which would have been right around the same location as the signal, could have produced it as a result of the hydrogen within it heating up. But he also said a comet producing this strong of a signal is unlikely. So at the moment we still aren't sure where this came from, and many say it is the strongest candidate we currently have for alien life. But that's not the only strange signal we've picked up from space. For example, in 2007 the first ever fast radio burst was discovered. Fast radio bursts are very intense but very short bursts of radio emissions, usually lasting just a few milliseconds. They appear throughout the sky but their source and what's causing them are unknown. We've only detected a few dozen of these bursts where each one comes from different locations in space, but one really threw us a curveball and that was FRB 121102, because unlike other bursts, this one repeated. In fact, in one day in August 2017, 93 of these pulses were detected, all coming from the same source. See, at first researchers thought fast radio bursts came from one-time events like colliding black holes. And that's because once we detected a radio burst, we'd never detect one again from that same location, which is still usually what happens. But things totally changed with this new discovery. Whatever was causing these bursts was ongoing. So could this be alien life? Well, probably not. Because the FRB 121102 signal, for example, is said to be coming from a galaxy 3 billion light years away. And the amount of energy that needs to be released to send these signals that far across space, given the power level we receive them at, exceeds almost anything else in the universe. So something really powerful, way beyond human capabilities, must be causing these. Rotating neutron stars and black holes all the way to alien life have been theorized as sources, but overall fast radio bursts still leave scientists very puzzled. And I honestly could go on about all the strange space-related phenomena that we can't explain. Classic examples would be like dark matter or dark energy, which could help explain galaxy formations and why the universe is expanding, respectively. Or a lesser known example would be something like Tabby's star. Located almost 1500 light years from Earth, this star experiences large dips in brightness, sometimes up to 22% at strange intervals. This reduction in brightness indicates that something must be blocking nearly half the width of the star, but scientists aren't sure what's causing that. Some have proposed a large dust ring, comets, and more, however we just don't know. But what about things here on Earth? Things that we experience every day but still can't fully explain, because there's actually more than you might think. For example, did you know that science cannot yet fully explain why bikes can stay upright without a rider on them? 
Because, I mean, if you take your bike and push it hard enough, it will move forward on its own, and given smooth enough terrain, it won't fall over until it slows down enough. There are several factors that help explain this, but there's no single explanation that science currently has for why this happens. I mean, we do know a good amount. We've learned that gyroscopic effects do help with steering, but those effects overall aren't as important as we once thought. And we know that specifics in the layout of the bike, such as the contact point being behind the steering axis, help the bike make corrections when it starts to turn on its own. So we know a lot about what does and doesn't have an effect on this, but the analysis is not complete. If you want more info on all of this, Minute Physics did an entire detailed video which I'll link below, because the everyday phenomenon I want to discuss is turbulence. Not only is this something that math and physics cannot currently explain, but if you find a way to, you'll win a million dollars. Well, sort of. Let me explain. The Millennium Prize problems are a list of seven problems in the field of mathematics that are, let's just say, very difficult to solve, some of which you need maybe a master's degree in math just to understand. But the reward for solving any one of these is a million dollars, and so far only one has been solved. Now, of the six remaining, the one we're looking at is the Navier-Stokes existence and smoothness. The Navier-Stokes equations are kind of like F equals MA for fluids, whether it be water, air, or something else. These equations essentially tell us how fluids will move, and thus they often involve turbulence. But the thing is, these are incredibly difficult to solve. I mean, solutions do exist, but we usually have to make assumptions that simplify the math a lot. And in the real world, we require computers to just get us good approximations. So yeah, there is a lot we do know when it comes to fluids, but our understanding is not complete. In fact, the equations are so difficult that the million dollar prize doesn't require finding a solution. It goes to the person who proves that given some initial conditions, a solution does or doesn't exist in three dimensions. As in answering the million dollar question won't necessarily lead to a physical explanation of turbulence. It might just say that solutions do exist. However, this would be a starting point. Richard Feynman once said turbulence was the most important unsolved problem in classical physics, probably since it applies to a bunch of things from submarines to planes to the medical field and more. But there's just a lot we can't answer now mathematically or physically, and Navier-Stokes is a crucial step to fixing this problem. But of all the other unsolved Millennium Prize problems, there is one that could really change things. Mm, maybe. Again, let me explain. This is P versus NP. P versus NP essentially says, if a solution to a problem can be verified quickly, can it also be found quickly? This is an oversimplification that I'll fix in a second. Now, if I handed you a solved Sudoku, for anyone who knows the rules, it wouldn't take too long to say that yes, it is in fact solved correctly, or no, it's not. It's easy to verify. But solving a blank Sudoku cannot be done as quickly. And I'm talking algorithmically here. We don't know a way to solve a Sudoku very efficiently. A problem that is maybe easy to solve, but definitely easy to verify, is known as an NP problem. Another example of an NP problem would be prime factorization. If I told you that this number is made up of two prime factors, it wouldn't be very easy to find those factors without just guessing and checking. Currently, we don't know if there's an efficient algorithm to solve this. Whereas if I told you that these are the factors, it might take like a minute or two by hand to verify that it is correct. Compare this to P problems, though, that are easy to solve and thus easy to verify. Oh, and just to make the correction now, easy means can be done in polynomial time. To see what that means, just take multiplying two numbers. This is a P problem. If both of the numbers have two digits, I will at the minimum have to multiply four values together using traditional elementary style multiplication and then add the results. If there are three digits each, then I'll have to do nine multiplications and add the results. And with four digits each, there would be 16 multiplications and so on. The number of multiplications is the square of those input digits. So even with 20 digits each, we need to do a few hundred operations, which isn't too tough for a computer. This is polynomial time, which tells us how complex the problem gets as the input gets larger. This scales as the input value squared, assuming the two numbers have the same length. But polynomial time includes n to the third, fourth, or n to the 10,000th. Compare this to fastest route algorithms. If there were four cities you need to visit, finding the fastest route by brute force wouldn't take too long, but already by 10 cities, there are millions of possible routes. The complexity scales much faster in what we call factorial time complexity. So of all these problems in P and all the seemingly more difficult problems outside classified as NP, 
Computer scientists and mathematicians are looking to see whether in fact these two classes are the same. As in maybe all the more complex problems can be solved in polynomial time. Because if that's true, that would change things. It wouldn't be by simply saying yes they're the same, but if along the way researchers also found efficient algorithms to solve those more complicated problems as quickly as the easy ones, that would change a lot. Shortest path and routing algorithms, optimization algorithms, and methods to break public key cryptography could all become more efficient with this find. In fact, public key cryptography itself is a big concern since it's built upon hard problems to solve dealing with prime numbers. And prime numbers are something that we don't fully understand yet either. Now, here I was either going to transition to the things we do and don't know about prime numbers, their distributions, and so on, or I was going to do cool cryptography stories, and I think we're going to go with the latter because I find these stories really interesting. I mean, we all know the most famous example, the breaking of Enigma, a German encryption device used during World War II that a team of codebreakers cracked, which historians believe shortened the war by several years. But another example that's less known is the Zimmermann telegram. This was also written by Germany, but sent to Mexico in 1917 during World War I. Along the way, it was intercepted by British intelligence, and it was then decoded. The contents of the letter revealed that Germany was proposing an alliance with Mexico if the US were to enter the war against Germany. This was released to the public, and it was not well received by Americans, and this is said to be one of the biggest reasons for the US entering the war. Then there's also the Babington plot, which was an attempt to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I. This was discovered by decrypting messages from Mary, Queen of Scots, who was playing the whole thing, and she ended up being executed because of it. But in the spirit of this video, let's see some ciphers and encrypted messages that still to this day, we have not yet cracked. In 2012, so not too long ago, a man in the UK was renovating his chimney when he found the skeleton of a dead carrier pigeon from World War II, and around the pigeon's leg was a letter containing an encrypted message. Some believe the pigeon was headed to Bletchley Park, exactly where Alan Turing and his co-workers were working to break Enigma. After this got around, several codebreakers attempted to decipher what the message said, but it seems that no one has been able to yet. Then in the 1960s, several murders were committed by someone who still to this day remains a mystery. The pseudonym given to this person is the Zodiac Killer. Unlike most serial killers who avoid the police, this one sent several letters to the press and law enforcement, essentially taunting them, taking credit for the killings and telling them of more to come. He sent dozens of these letters, but there's a very famous set of four letters that were encrypted messages. The longest one of the four was quickly deciphered, which you can see here on the screen. And the second longest seems to be partially solved. But the other two remain a mystery. The shortest of those says, my name is, followed by the encrypted portion, and many think this will never be cracked due to its short length. Now yes, crypto analysts and people on the internet are very aware of the possibility that these are gibberish and some of the text or letters may just be the killer trying to mess with people, but no one is sure. Whether the Zodiac Killer would give up his real name, or whether he's even still alive are very much unknown, and it still remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries that we know of. But I'll end with what may be the strangest unsolved mystery I've ever heard of, and that is the mystery of the Somerton Man. Seriously, every detail of this is just weirder than the last. On December 1st, 1948, a man was found dead on the Somerton Park beach in South Australia. His body was found propped up against the seawall, and he was neatly dressed in a suit and nice shoes that were recently polished. Who this man is, even his name, and what killed him are still unknown to this day. Researchers speculate that maybe he was poisoned by something that couldn't be detected, but there's no proof of this. However, the details we do know get weird very quickly. Like all the name tags and labels had been cut from the clothing on the Somerton man's body. Then found deep within a hidden pocket in his pants was a rolled up sheet of paper that said to mom should, a Persian phrase meaning it's ended, indicating maybe it was a suicide, but even that is still a mystery. Anyway, they determined that the paper had been torn from a book called the Rubiot, and thus a search for that book began. Turns out the book had possibly been tossed into a car in the same area, as that's where they found the page that had the torn section. Then in that same book, they also found a phone number and an encrypted message. That message was sent to crypto analysts and has since been analyzed by many, but all attempts to decrypt the message have failed. The phone number, on the other hand, belonged to a woman named Jessica Thompson. When she was interviewed about the Somerton man, she claimed to not know who he was, 
but when she was presented with his image, she apparently looked at it briefly before diverting her eyes to the floor, where she continued to look throughout the interview. Police described her as generally evasive and said it seemed like she had some knowledge of this man's identity, but we still just aren't sure what role she played in all of this. It wasn't until decades later that they found out a lot of what she said was a lie. In fact, her daughter even came forward saying, I've always had a fear that maybe she was responsible for his death. She said that her mother did in fact know who he was, but beyond that we really don't have many answers. At the time, the news of this man spread around the world, but not a single person claimed to know him, and to this day people are still looking into the case. There are several theories that could explain things, including his identity, but no one knows for sure. Now there are so many details to this that I'll post below because you could spend days learning about this story. In fact, several of these cryptography stories, which I don't have time to get into, can keep you quite occupied. The ciphers given to Richard Feynman by a fellow scientist that have never been cracked. The crypto sculpture located in front of the CIA with one still unsolved message. All the way to Cicada 3301, probably the most mysterious internet puzzle which no one knows the origins of. All of these and more can definitely keep you busy. But before you go down any internet rabbit hole, make sure to keep your internet searches and personal info secure, which you can do with NordVPN, the sponsor of that buttery smooth transition. If you're someone who simply wants their personal information from credit cards to passwords and more secure, you should really consider a VPN. Whenever you do basically anything online, that activity is traceable and can be linked right back to your device. Even if you don't purchase things online, your activity is still being routed through your internet service provider where it can be tracked, sold to the highest bidder, or even hacked. See, having an unsecured internet connection makes your IP address very public, allowing even companies to form a profile of who you are just based on that address. And things can get more dangerous when you're connected to an open Wi-Fi network like in a Starbucks, McDonald's, or airport. All these things that you don't want are fixed through the use of a VPN. Simply put, VPNs or virtual private networks take all the creepy stuff you look up on the internet and route it through a remote VPN server or kind of this encrypted tunnel instead of it going to your internet service provider. And as a result, your IP address will be completely hidden, your internet activity will be unreadable by third parties, and your internet connection will be completely hack-proof. You can pick from thousands of servers worldwide to connect to so your internet activity cannot be traced back to your device. So on top of internet safety, if you're anywhere in the world where certain websites are being censored, you can use a VPN to get around this. NordVPN also allows you to connect up to six devices, so not only your desktop, but your laptop and mobile device will be secure as well. It's extremely affordable, and with the link below you'll get 75% off a three-year plan, plus one month free, which comes out to not even 10 cents a day. And on top of this, there's a 30-day full refund money-back guarantee if you're not satisfied, so there's no risk in just giving it a try. Again, links are below, and with that, we'll end that video there. Also, just wanted to give a huge thank you to my supporters on Patreon. Really appreciate the help from you guys. For updates, be sure to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group. Hit the bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.